let's turn to Psalm 27. Uh, kind of, um, uh, I pray with the Lord's help, kind of scratch something together this afternoon um, that hopefully will help us, encourage us. Um, uh, Psalm 27 and verse 14. Uh, it says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And we've probably all heard that verse before, read that verse at some time. Some of you may have read it many, many times. Uh, but I was thinking this afternoon that one of the desires, one of the uh, attributes that God created us with is the need to be successful. That God has put in our very being, our very nature, every single one of us, a want or a desire to be a success. Amen? And, and of course, as part of that uh, need of to be successful, um, there, what is connected with that is a need or a want to please. We all want to please, and success and please go hand in hand. You can't be successful without pleasing, amen? In fact, success is really just a measure of pleasure. That's what it is. Success, if I'm successful, I have a degree or a measure of pleasure because not to succeed is what? Of course, it's to fail. And has anybody here ever failed? And what does it feel like? It feels miserable. You don't feel pleasurable, do you? Amen? You, you get those feelings and emotions of being a loser. And uh, it brings you down. But God never made you to have those feelings of being a loser or make you feel down. God has always made you to be successful. God wants you lifted up and not to be pulled down. Amen. So I believe that when God made Adam and through Adam, the rest of us, God created us to be successful people. Amen. Of course, the world, of course, sees success in a very different way. Amen. So when I think of success and, and, and how God made us, uh, I believe that God wanted us to experience success. God wanted us to experience the feelings and emotions of success. What are some of the feelings and emotions of being successful? What do you think they might be? Would one be satisfied? I feel satisfied. Amen. Um, I feel content. Would that be a measure of success? Amen. Um, would pleasure be a measure of success? If you feel pleasure, are you being successful? Well, of course you are. Now, what does the Bible identify as pleasure? You know, the world identifies success with pleasure. It um, identifies contentment with success. But how does the Word of God describe success? How does the Word of God describe successful? I am successful. Uh, I, am, I have pleasure. I am content. I am satisfied. What did God call that? Blessed, Blessed yes. What else? Righteousness. Victorious, what else? You Don't you enter into a state that we call a state of rest? To be in a state of rest is to be truly successful, amen? The Bible describes successful as being in that place of rest. Of course, not death rest, amen, but being able to rest in your physical life, amen? Now, also, uh, when you read the New Testament especially, what do the New Testament writers tell us to do? Yes, of course, but I'm, go I'm getting beyond rest now. Something else. What did Paul tell us to do? He invoked us to do what? To rejoice. He said, and again, rejoice evermore. He told us that we are to rejoice. See, rejoicing, pleasure, they're all measured to success. What he's really telling us, we, we need to be a successful people. Okay? 
And of course, He's told us to, be, to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. But of course, um, um, when, you, when you think about it, for us, success is rest. For the world, success is what? Things. Money. Possessions. Uh, position. Title. Amen. And of course, as you discover through time that the title and the possession and the thing, don't give them rest. True success, God's success, gives us rest. Amen. Gives us contentment. You see, some people identify contentment as compromise. Well, you should just be content with what you have. But that is not what success is. Success is not simply to be content with what you have. Success is a feeling and emotion you have in your very being that you can rejoice. Rejoicing is not, a, is, is not the world's uh, 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 meaning of content. The world's content is, well, you just be happy with what you've got. That's not our God. Our God is El Shaddai. Amen. He's not saying be happy with what you've got. Amen. Don't be content with what you've got. He wants you to have true success. That brings rest to you. That brings a true contentment to you where you have no desire for anything else. Amen. <coughs> to be satisfied in God is to have your full. To be satisfied in the world is, well, I'm okay now, but I need more tomorrow. Amen. That is not what God wants for us. Amen. You see, sadly, what we do many times, and we do it ourselves, you do it, I do it, is we fall, out, or we fall into the trap of trying to measure success by what I am or what I have. Amen. And of course, when we do that, and then we discover that, we discover that somebody else has a bit more than what you have, what does it do to that moment of satisfaction you had? It suddenly disappears because now I want what that person has had because that person is perceived to be more happier than what I am. So that would be unrest. Notice that that, 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 that man's thought of what success is, it, it, it brings them unrest and they're never content. They never have that rest that God wants for us. Amen. You see, when you judge physically, and remember it was Paul who said, rejoice, and I say rejoice, and I say rejoice and be glad. And... But you see, where did Paul spend most of his time? He was prisoned, shipwrecked, all right, had nothing. Amen, just, uh, you know, threats, and constant state of threat. How can you rejoice and be happy in that? But he counted that as being successful. Amen. He said, in, 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 in the state I am, whether it be in prison, in threat or stoned or shipwrecked, I am at rest. I am successful. I'm just so happy. And it's not a happiness that disappears. Amen. And it's, and, and it's not a happiness that can be changed by the circumstance that the world puts in front of us. And that is that happiness that I believe that God would have for you and me. Amen. You see, now, many would consider, you know, prison, shipwreck, threats. Who's had threats against them? And what does that bring to you? Stress. True. Stress. Uh, 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 you know, uh, worry. Fret. Anger. Amen. But Paul had the exact same thing. You know, unjust, unjustly beaten, unjustly threatened, unjustly this and unjustly that, but yet he was in a state where he could rejoice and he could be glad because he had found the true success that God had ordained for him and his life and equally ordained for your life. And so that all that worldly stuff of what the world counts success or failure no longer had a hold on him. Amen? You imagine if you had that kind of life where you were content, I mean biblically content, then whatever the world tried to throw at you would simply just wash off your back. 
wouldn't it? And you wouldn't be wasting all those hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of worrying about something that you have no control over anyway. Isn't that how we spend so much of our, of, of our time in a state of worry and fret and, 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 and just concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow? And all the while you have no say in the matter whatsoever. It's out of your control. That's how I think Paul lived his life. Well, no point worrying about what prison I'm going to be in tomorrow. I mean, that prison will find me just when it needs me. Isn't that how it is? You know, brother, you'll solve one business problem and one twice as big will come your way in a month's time. It's just life. It's how it is. Ask anybody in business. I mean, just, uh, just uh, when you think, well, I've got this one solved, it's easy street now, there's another wall that hits you. That's how God made this world. Just accept it. You know, uh, this, this uh, weekend, uh, what was I saying again about um, uh, the patience one? No, the uh, experience. You can't buy experience. Is that what he said? You can't buy experience. Experience must be gained. You can't be a businessman by buying business. You have to gain experience. This part, it's just part of the way it works. Amen? You've got to feel it all. <laughs> Amen? Or else it would be very simple. You know, it's, it's amazing when you read some of the you know, people who have made it and how many, failure, how many failures they had before they made it. Because experience must be gained. It's just how it is. Amen. It's not for us to worry over, it's for us to simply get over top of. Amen. Now, so when we look at the life of Paul I mean, and you know, people and Barnabas and Silas, today's people accept that he's a failure. How can you be happy in those things? How can you be happy when you're perceived to be down? But Paul never saw himself as being down. He saw himself as being highly successful. And because he was successful, he could rejoice. Can you imagine being in prison at midnight, beaten? in shackles and just lean and say, Silas, it's time for us to sing. It's time for us to praise our God. We've got nothing to be sad about. Amen. We are the most successful people here in Philippi. And my brothers and sisters, you are the most successful people here in Caloundra, whether you believe that or not. God made you to succeed and you are a success. And in that you need to be glad. You need to feel the emotion, I mean, and the feelings of being successful because that's exactly what you are, amen? <coughs> you see, the sad thing is this. Many people, most people never come to that place of feeling success because when they think they have a hold of it, something comes to take it away from them. Very, very, very few people actually taste the feeling, I mean the feeling and the emotion of being successful because very, very, very few people actually experience the success that God has for them. Most people just have a kind of a Clayton success. That's what the world has because it's not true success because it does not bring them true pleasure. It does not bring them to that place of absolute rest. And then we have so many people who call themselves Christians and maybe some here tonight. And you're in the exact same boat. Is you cannot honestly stand up and say that you are successful and that you have truly tasted the feeling of what success is. That you are truly at rest and content where you are right now. And that's a shame because that's what God wants for you. That's part, part of, part of the, the blessing of being born again that you can come to that place where you feel success and where you know you are successful and where you can hold your head up high. Amen? That's what our Lord wants for us. Amen? This contentment, this happiness, this joy that gives us true pleasure. And of course, you know that pleasure is what? Rest. I am at rest. I don't care what the government does tomorrow. I don't care what the World Banks in Greek or France do next week. Amen. Because they have no bearing on my rest. Because I am content. Amen. I have the feeling of success. 
And that's what you've got to have. Amen. If uh, we are going to be those who are going to change the world, as Paul changed the world, as Barnabas and Silas and all those brethren in the early church changed the world, they did it because they were successful people. Amen. No, they didn't become successful. Uh Uh-uh. I mean, they achieved what they achieved because they were a successful people. People listen to other successful people. That's just how it is. Amen. They listen to people who have reached that place of rest, contentment, amen, who are glad in themselves, can rejoice in themselves knowing that they've made it. Have you made it tonight? How many have made it tonight? Come on, if you're on the Lord, you've made it. You know, there is nothing better, there's nothing greater to achieve than being born again. You have made it. You are the ultimate expression of being a success. Now you've just got to learn to live that and believe that and put it on the dial. I am a successful person. I've made it. Amen. I got saved against every odd. I got saved. I tell you what, uh, if you got saved, amen, you beat the odds. Amen. You climbed a mountain. Who climbed the mountain when they got saved? Hallelujah. You are the most successful people on the earth. Now it's time to believe it. Amen. Now it's the time to get the the, the glumness off the dial and put gladness there because God has put rest rest in your heart. Rest. Amen. Whether you believe that or not, if you don't believe it, start believing it. Because there's nothing else in your life you can attain that's going to take away or add to what you already have. In fact, you've got to be careful because if you don't believe what I'm telling you tonight, that which God gave you will be taken from you. Because if you have this mixed feeling that, well, if I only do better in my business, I only do better in my job, I only do better in this, you're going to have it stolen from you. Because what does the Word of God say about attaining the whole world and losing your soul? Amen. Whatever we do in the physical realm, amen, is from the basis of where I am right now. I am successful. Amen. I am at rest. There's nothing that I can do in this world that's going to change that. Amen. What I do from now on, amen, is for God and His kingdom. But it's not going to add to my rest. It can't add to my success. I mean, I became God's success on the day I was born again. Is that true? Now I've just got to stay in that place of rest, that place of happiness, that place that gives my life worth. Isn't that it? When you were born again, your life became valuable. Because God put himself in you. Amen. You became a valuable person, a successful person. Amen. For God to put himself in you, he said, you're a success. You're a success. God doesn't put his heart into losers. He puts them into winners, successful people. People who are going to take him and go all the way. And we need to make up our mind about that one too tonight. We're going all the way. We're not going to turn back. Amen. We carry something in us that we're going to carry until the day we die. And we need to resolve to do that. Amen. I'm not letting him go. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. You know, I was thinking today, this afternoon, How can I describe this success, this happiness, this pleasure? Have you ever noticed, you know, not that one there in the pink, but uh, maybe, look, I I speak from my own experience when I was little, and maybe you you can see this in yourself when you were little. Something that sometimes parents don't understand is when you're little, many times what you do, you want to do because you want to make mum and dad happy. All right? Because that's how God made us. He made us to please. Because that's what success is. Pleasure, please. Amen. 
But of course, what happens to us, and I speak from my own experience, is the world's measure of, ple of pleasure or pleasing is something very different. And we are either embarrassed in what we're doing, or we are beaten down in what we're doing. And of course, we suddenly change from being giving, we're trained to be selfish. We're trained to look out for number one. Why do children go off track? Because they're trained and taught that they're important and that they should look after themselves. Amen? But that's not how God made children to be. They, they were to be a pleasure. And I can find the scripture for you to show you that. That God gave you children, those who've had children, to please you. Amen? Not to be a rod. <laughs> Amen? But to please you. Because it's how you bring them up. That, it, that determines how much pleasure they will be to you. You need to train them to please you. Because that's why God made you, did he not? To please him. But the wonderful bonus is this. When you please, you are pleased. You can't please somebody without being pleased. You can't please God without being pleased in return. Amen? Another example of this, this inbuilt character, this, input, this inbuilt nature that God has put into, hu into the human being. When uh, people find themselves in dangerous or life-threatening situations, how many times does a complete stranger put their own lives at risk to save somebody else? Some even lose their lives in the act or the deed of saving somebody else. Why do they do that? Why? Because there is something inbuilt, something that God put into a human being that without them even thinking about it, without them even weighing up, well, if I do that, I might be in danger myself. They just go. I saw that thing, you know, with that, who saw the thing on the TV, on the TV where this guy went, un, went on his motorbike, went underneath the car, on fire. And then the car could have blown up. But what do people do? They just go there, grab the car and lift it with all their might to drag this guy out without thinking about it. Let's just do it. Because it's in us. But of course, the world tries to beat it out of us. But it's in us. It's in us to please. But the world says to you, nah, just look after yourself. But you know what? In the moment of crisis, the world can't beat it out of anybody. Because at the moment of crisis, most of humanity find themselves in a situation they would not get into if they thought about it to help somebody else. So what I'm saying is this tonight, that God has put within every human being the character of success. Because the God's will was for every one of us to be a success and to have the feeling and taste and the emotion of being truly successful. To be in that place of absolute rest. That's just how God made us, amen? I look when God made the creation in Genesis chapter one. And after he'd finished making Adam, or created Adam, he said, hey, it's very good. He made Adam very, very good, amen? And of course, if we are to understand, uh, or, or to understand the makeup of the human being and, and, and this phrase, very good, you only need to go to Revelation 4 and verse 11, which says what? Thou art worthy, we, we sing the song, Thou art worthy, for what? To receive glory, honour and praise. Thou art worthy, for what? Thou hast created all things, for what? For thy good pleasure. But I told you before that you cannot give pleasure without 
receiving pleasure, or put it this way, when you give pleasure, you receive pleasure. I mean, it's not, it, pleasure is never a one-way street. It's always reciprocal. If you give it, you receive it, amen? Uh, that's just how it is. What did God say? Whatever you sow, you shall reap. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. The, the world calls that the law of attraction. You hear people talking talk about that often, don't you? The law of attraction. No, they didn't dream that up. That's what God's Word says. Whatsoever you sow, that you shall reap. It's the law of likes. That's what it really is. It's the law of likes. Like attracts like. What does the world say? I'll get that in a moment. I'll get that in a moment. Let's get more on this thought. What you sow, you reap. Okay? It is a, we take, the, we take pleasure. And it's something that very few experience. Why do you think they don't experience it? If it's made, if, if we are made to succeed, why don't we succeed? Why do most people never succeed? Because what comes with, notice God said, I made you to pleasure me. But he also made the law that what you sow, you reap. Amen? The law of likes. Call it the law of likes. Call it the law of attraction. It doesn't make any difference. Amen? But what do we have to do first? Yes, what is giving? What's another word for giving? How does the, how does the Bible explain giving? What, what did they have to do in the Old Testament to please God? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Amen? There is no true pleasing without sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. If you want to experience the true feeling, which most people have never ever felt, of what true pleasure is, true success is, you first have to sacrifice. See, that's why people, most people never experience it. When you were born again, what did you have to do? You had to sacrifice yourself. Amen? And then to have this continual <coughs> experience of pleasure and rest, you must be continually be in that state of sacrifice. Amen? There is no pleasure outside of sacrifice. If we went to a, uh, you know, one of these high-flying business meetings okay, on success, they'd say the same thing. That you, will not have, you cannot have success without sacrifice. Amen? Now, think about it for a moment. The Bible says, likes attract. What does the world say? That's right, isn't that strange? Amen? The world thinks we're magnets. Amen? And they say, opposites attract. Amen? Whereas the Bible says what? Like attracts. Amen? You become... You become what you associate with. That's how it is, you see. You likes attract. What, whatever you attract to yourself, that's what you become. I mean, that's why we are so careful about the friends our children are with. Because we know that if they're with the wrong ones, they'll eventually become just like them. Amen. I remember not so long ago having a conversation with somebody about relationships. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, gee, that, that'd make a good, uh, a good uh, couple. And uh, this person said, oh, no, that, that'll never, ever work because they, you know, they're just so much alike. It won't work. You know, it, it's peas in a pod kind of thing. You know, the, the, you know the, it's, it's opposites that work. You've got to be opposite. But that's just it. Look, the world is full of opposites. How many of them continue to go? Look at divorce rates. Look at dating. Amen? <laughs> Likes attract. Likes work together. Amen? If you're looking for somebody tonight, you need to find somebody who's just like you. That's what will last. If you seek something opposite, that means somebody has to be broken. You are, brother, I know. Snapped. 
Hey, you're like a little twig. But is, uh, am I speaking the truth or not? If you want a lasting relationship, you should find likes. Yeah, if somebody is just like you, that's the one. Nobody has to change. We're going in the same direction. We like the same things. Amen. Isn't that a good place to start? God, we, we love the same God. We love the same Bible. Amen. We love the same people. Amen. We love the same food. We love the same this. We love the same that. We love the same tidiness. We love the same mess. We love... But what does the world do? They say, oh no, that'll never work. But they're working against the very law they believe in. The law of attraction, the law of likes. The Bible says what you sow is what you reap. People are not magnets. Amen. God didn't make you a magnet. Amen. He made you a human being. Amen. With that, that inner whatever you want to call it, that likes, likes. Amen. He put that law into place that whatsoever we sow, that is what we're going to reap. You see, my, my, but my point is this, and, and it's a very important point, is this. We are allowing the world to infiltrate our minds. Forget about Babylon. We are allowing the world to put things into our heads that are just so foreign to God's Word. Amen? And the problem is, and I'll just stick with the relationship thing for a moment. Amen? Because the world puts things into our heads and other people put things into our heads and our best friends put things in our, into our heads and our, and, and, and our mothers and our fathers and our brothers and sisters put things into our heads that we miss the very opportunity that's before our eyes. I mean, God's blessing is missed. Because, oh, I need something that's not like me. Well, what's wrong with you? Huh? If there's something wrong with you, change to be the person you need to be. And get somebody who's just the same because you're happy. We weren't preaching on uh, that tonight. <laughs> Amen. But God says, likes attract. And you know, that's good and bad. <laughs> Amen. But we're with Psalm 27. Let's go back to Psalm 27. Amen. Wait on the Lord and, he, uh, and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen the heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So here we are seeing what connection, we're seeing the connection of weight and what else? Two words, weight and courage, right? Weight and courage. Turn over to Psalm 37. And we'll get there real soon. Verse 7. You know, we've done enough meddling tonight, brother. We've done enough meddling tonight. Okay. Verse 7. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him, fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Now, there we have the word rest. Rest in the Lord. Wait upon him. Don't fret. Amen. We know in Psalm 40 it says what? Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. What did Jesus say to those? He made it in a invitation. He said, "Come unto me, all you who are what labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." He said, "Come to me." We're talking about success. Courage. What does it say in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1? You remember Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who are 
who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does it say in Revelation 14 verse 1? Where is the Lord? He's on Mount Zion. Amen. And what about down in verse 4, I think it is. What are those doing who come to Him? They are following Him. What does it say? Wherever He goeth. The point I'm trying to make is this. Is that waiting is not passive. It's not a waiting as we understand to just sit there and wait. I mean, it is a continual going wherever the Lord is. When we think of the word success, courage, who else do we think of? Who in the Bible, you know, where the word courage and prosper and success? Joshua. Joshua was told to be successful. Let's, let's, well, he was promised that he would be a success in Joshua uh, uh, chapter 1. Let's go there because it's just a... Verse 5, it says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of, of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and be of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which, the, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper uh, whithersoever thou goest. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse 9, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good, good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wheresoever thou goest. Notice that? We have to do something. We have to move. Amen? You see, this waiting is not a passive waiting. I mean, it is a different kind of a word. It's that serving word. We must serve the Lord. Amen? It's kind of the same thing that Paul said in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. What did he say? I beseech thee, brethren, by the mercy of God, that thou present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Don't listen to this world. I mean, because they always turn things upside down. They'll have you believing that you'll be happy with somebody who's not like you. Where God says, you will be happy when you find like. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. Don't be conformed to this world. I mean, this world will tell you that you'll be successful when you have a million dollars. But the problem is when you get the million, you find you're not successful. God says, you just get me who is priceless in your heart and you will be the success. Amen? He said, be not conformed to this, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen? This thing you've got in here, be renewed in here. Don't listen to them. Listen to my word. What was the promise that God made to Joshua? Forget about what they're saying all around. Just meditate in my word. Just believe what I say about you. And I tell you what, brothers, there's some of you here tonight, you need to believe what God says about you. God says you are my success. You are my pleasure. Amen. You're the apple of my eye. I know every hair on your head. Amen. I have invested in you. I've invested myself in you. That's how much I have confidence in you tonight. That I have invested myself in you. I mean, it's like you're saying, look, lift up your head, put a smile on your dial, and act successful because you are successful. You know, why was Joshua told to read the Word? Because God knew that things would come against him that would try to pull him down. True? 
So God was saying to him, look, Joshua, keep renewing your mind. Don't believe what they're saying to you. Just believe me. In my eye, you are my success. And that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Amen? Amen. You see, again, this pleasure that God has for you, this success that God has for you, is based on sacrifice. You got to give it before you get it. You got to sell it before you reap it. See, and that's the problem we have today. Well, I, I want a down payment first. I want to taste first. I want to see what I'm going to get. And God says, that's, not, that's just not how the law works. Amen. You have to sow it before you get it. Amen. Be, amen. If you want somebody to love you, what are you going to do? Love first. But you see, this world's got it all around the other way. Well, I'm just looking for somebody to love me. I'm just looking for somebody to be my friend. I'm just looking for somebody to do this, somebody to do that, somebody, somebody to do something for me. Well, do something for somebody. Amen? That's how it comes back to you. That's how God says it comes back to you. Of course, if you do nothing, what comes back? Nothing. And that's why most of the world fails. Because they do nothing. Why do people remain on welfare? Because they do nothing. You guys have got a leg up. God already says you are my success. Amen? I mean, it's, it's uh, like, uh, you know, uh, we got a jump start on everybody else. Because we're not looking what we're doing in our, phys in, in our, phys in our physical lives to, to add anything to us on that satisfaction level. Because we're already satisfied. Amen. Nothing that, that this world could give us ought to change than what we are and how we feel in, in, in our inner person. Nothing. Because if that were true, then Paul was a failure. I'm, I'm just trying to say, look, <laughs> those things don't matter. Whatever you're doing in your physical life is not to add to your person. God's already made you what you are and what you need to be. You know, if, if, a, if a Paul thought that there was something he needed, he needed to do in, in, the, in, in the physical, so to speak, amen, he'd have built a tent business. You understand what I'm sort of saying? He'd have said, no, look, I haven't got time to go to Ephesus today because I've got to go and do this. Yeah, I've got to look after my business. I've got to do this. I've got to build, 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 build because I want to be a successful tent maker. But he didn't have to do that. He wasn't striving for that. Because he already had it in his heart. He already knew, hey, I am amen, the success. There is nothing that this world can do that can change or add to this feeling, if you like, this emotion that I already have. But you're going to believe it. You've got to know it, accept it. The just shall walk by faith. And it, it really is, I must say, simple. I've kind of finished with this when I was writing this afternoon. I said, Why am I not experiencing? this true, enduring satisfaction. Can I truly wholeheartedly count myself among the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 14? Could I hold my head up high in the company of Paul, James, Peter, Bartholomew, John, Remember John said, I, John, who also am your brother 
and companion in tribulation? You know, when I meet John, will I be able to hold my head up and be a success? Or will I have to kind of look down? Well, I better look at these men. I think of Priscilla. Who else was there? Phoebe. Well, I better look them in the eye. Sarah. Well, I be able to look them in the eye as a successful person, as they were a success? Or will I have to kind of look away? How about you? Where do you think you are? How would, how would you act in the presence of these brothers and sisters? Remember, John was trying to give us the impression, trying to show us that he was no better than anybody else in the kingdom. I am your brother. And I'll tell you what, if that brother was here tonight, he'd look us straight in the eye and call us brothers and sisters. But how would we look back at him? Would we be able to stand his gaze? Or would we have to look away? You know what I mean? You know, when you come across people who are truly successful, you know, they have that, you know, that, that, that ring of confidence. Amen. And, and, and you're pretending. And, and you just can't quite hold their gaze. Well, John said, you are my brothers. You're my sisters. We ought to be able to look each other eye to eye. Amen. That's what he was telling us. And if we can't do that, there's something wrong. We're not the success that God says we need to be. Amen. You see, I was thinking about, could I do more? Huh? Could I follow him closer? Could I keep pace with the Lord? How about you? Do you reckon you could follow him a little bit closer? Anybody feel like you should be following him a little bit closer? Do you feel like at times you're, you know, just, just trying to keep pace? Why is that? What's going on? Is it because we're allowing our minds to be unrenewed? I like your testimony tonight, sister. I really do. I'm talking about you, Sister Margaret. Amen. The world was trying to beat your brains. The devil was trying to beat your brain and say, you don't need to go there tonight. But there was enough renewing in that brain of yours, that mind of yours, saying, no, I need to be there. Amen. What if I started counting my time as being valuable? What would that do for me? What do you think? What if I made myself accountable to time? Would that help? Do you think? Huh? You know what? God holds you accountable for your time. Does he not? So what would happen if we take responsibility for our time? Instead of just letting it wash under the bridge. Because the problem with time washed under the bridge is regret. And regret is not a um, character of success. True? People who are successful account for their time. I'm not telling you what you've got to do with your time. I'm telling you that you should account for your time. There's a difference. I'm not saying you've got to get on your knees for seven hours a day and you can't do this and you can't do that. No, but I am telling you that what you do is account for your time. 
Too much of our time is just gone without us, us even knowing it's gone. You know, you look at it, it's one o'clock in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon, the next minute it's four o'clock. Where'd it go? Well, it went somewhere. It was, you didn't account for it. A man would have been far different if you had planned your time. And you could have still been doing what you were doing. But now you have made yourself accountable to your time. True? Do you kind of understand what I'm getting at? I'm not saying that you have to change your life, but we need to account for our lives. That's the difference. Because God has made you and I successful. And if we will continue to sacrifice, and of course keeping account of our time is sacrifice as well. It's certainly examination, isn't it? What would happen if I made myself accountable for my time? How would that change my life? I said this morning, we've got how many hours in a week? 168. Round figures, 40 we have no control over because we go work for the boss, we go work for the business. Okay, whether you go work for the boss or you work for uh, Amalek Proprietary Limited, both exactly the same. All right, it's the boss. They both want their pound of flesh. True? Amen, so that's 40 hours, you've got no, you, you know, that's, that's why you get paid for it. Because they, you know, you get money for the time you give. Amen? And then we sleep for how many hours a week? 56, another 56 hours of the week are gone. Amen? Guys, you've got to sleep. That's how God made us. But then how many hours we got left? Brother, you're doing the mathematics now. I'd have kept them round figures, but you've now mucked me up. <laughs> we've got 78 hours left. 78 hours that most of us never give an account for. I don't think I do. Do you? Do you honestly account for the other 78 hours? 40 hours are out of your control. 56 hours are really out of your control. But you've got 70 something hours. You know, more time than the others <laughs> that we don't give an account for. We waste them. We daydream. Um, what if we started by were you having a bit of a daydream then? <laughs> I realise, you know, let's face it. Um, okay, there's, there's eating and so forth. Okay, they'll chew up a few, a few more hours. Some of, some of the women here might be thinking, yeah, but there's washing and dishes and so forth. That's part of your 40 hours. Well, some people shower more than others. Some, some go four minutes, some go 15 minutes. I realise that, but you still, we just take all that off and you still find you've got <coughs> hours that are um, a large quantity. That's a concept, isn't it? What if we, as a first step, made a decision that we are going to allocate some of that unallocated time on a voluntary basis to the work of the Lord every week? In fact, what I'm going to ask you to do tonight is give your time to me. I gave you the example this morning of you know, the, this big university outfit where going to scan the universe. There's huge computing powers to do that apparently. And they're asking us for millions of people to give, just to join their computers up. And they'd use whatever spare CPU power you had and just put all the little bits added together would make a supercomputer. Um, we have the example that I think I spoke of a few months ago, you know, where the one cent in 31 days becomes 100 million cents. Is that right? 
one cent turns to $10 million in one month. If you double it, 31 times. Isn't that powerful? The truth is that a little bit, if we all do a little, we'll do something big. But of course we've got to account. Some of you might say, well I can give five minutes. That's fine, that's kind of how the computer setup worked. You know, if you've got a little PC, all right, we'll just take the bit you've got left there and we'll use it when you're not using it. Some of you might say, well, hey, I can give an hour a week. Some might say, well, I can give two hours. I can give 30 minutes, I can give 15 minutes. Whatever it is, that's what you're going to give and you'll be asked to give that whenever during, you, some weeks you may not have to give anything. But when you're asked to give it, you have to, all right? No choice of what it's going to be. Yeah, hey, uh, you promised me one hour. Here's the task for this week. Oh, I, 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 I want to, no, no. Your little PC has no say what the supercomputer is going to do with your, um, your, your bit of computer. You, you said you're going to give one hour. Who's willing to do that? Should I hand the, ha the pad around? You've got a piece of paper? I can hand the pad around. And all you've got to do is put your name on it, your email address, and what you are willing to give on a weekly basis. All right? We're not going to change it. Okay? If you say 10 hours this week, you can't change it to five hours next week. Okay? <laughs> Vice versa, if you say I'm going to give 15 minutes, and you decide, oh, I think I'll give one hour because such and such should give more, that's your tough luck. We don't want any more or any, there won't be any more, any less than what you put on the piece of paper. Okay, so think about it wisely. Okay? Some of you might not want to do anything. It's fine too. Okay, you might be full up as it is. And some people's computers, they're going flat out. Okay, you, you know, you go into the settings there and you look at the, C, the CPUs going at 100%. All right, and there's nothing, that's fine too. Okay? That's, that's why I simply want you to write your name down, email address, put your uh, time on there, rip it out, fold it up, nobody else sees. Okay? There's nothing secret about it.